Okay, so uh, I remind you what we did last time, and uh, essentially we talked about about the, uh, about inverse problems, right? So we had some uh, some forward model allow allow me to write it uh, completely in the language of uh, random signals. So we have some latent signal f, of which we think of uh, of as a stochastic quantity. We have an, a, a measurement. So uh, uh, f again, we can interpret f either as a deterministic quantity or as a stochastic quantity. Doesn't matter. So we had basically both views. Uh, but now I want to think of it as a as a stochastic quantity. So essentially, we sample it from some uh, distribution of signals, and what we observe is the uh, is uh, a measurement y that is sampled from this conditional uh, distribution y given f okay but of course it is sampled from from uh, the distribution y given f but we don't have access to f right f is latent we don't measure it we measure y we don't measure f and our goal is to obviously to estimate f we we've seen the maxima posteriori estimator map which was minimizing the uh, posterior probability, right? So the posterior probability was pf given y. Okay, this was the posterior probability, so we saw that by Bayes' theorem, this can be written, if we take the log, it can be written as the sum of log the likelihood, right? The likelihood is the distribution that gives us the observation, right? Plus the log of uh, the log of the of this distribution uh, pf, right, which we call the prior. And of course, since we like minimization problems just to keep uh, the notation consistent, we take the negative log of the, of the density and we get a minimization problem. So we are minimizing the negative log uh, of the likelihood minus log of the prior. Okay, so again, in, in, the, Bayesian, in the Bayesian language, prior is what you know about your signal uh, before taking any measurements. And then the posterior that you are trying to, to maximize, or the negative log posterior that you are trying to minimize, which is given by the sum of these two terms, is what you know about your signal after you took the measurements. Okay, so this likelihood term is the contribution that the measurements give you to the knowledge about the latent signal f. And essentially, this prior, this prior term is what we are currently going to look for. Okay, so we, we've seen some very uh, naive and and unrealistic examples of priors that we can that we can uh, assume on our uh, latent signal, but uh, we want to do better. Okay, and the the better we can uh, the better we can do our prior, the the better is our chance to solve the inverse problem. So essentially, the prior embodies our knowledge about the latent signal f. Okay, so this was just map. Of course, th there is a whole world beyond map, we can do different types of estimators. This is, for example, a Bayesian estimator. A Bayesian estimator is a very, it's a very wide class of estimators. So Bayesian estimator, remember it, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of taking the maximum of the, of the posterior, we minimized the posterior expectation of some loss function, which I'm writing here. Okay, so the posterior expectation of the loss function, you see this is posterior expectation with respect to this posterior density. I can write it again using Bayes' theorem. I can write it like this. So this expectation again requires the the, the prior requ requires the knowledge of uh, of some prior distribution on our signal. Okay. And a particular example of uh, of a Bayesian estimator is an MMSC estimator that we have seen, for example, in the form of a Wiener filter. Here again, we have the prior term. Okay. So we need a good prior in order to be able to um, to uh, solve inverse problems. Okay, and by the way, if we assume if we have no prior at all, what prior would we assume? So if I have some quantity and I I, I have no prior knowledge about how it behaves, so I will uh, then I will the the we now in absence of any prior knowledge, I will assume a uniform prior, and the uniform prior will make. For example, let, let's have a look at the map again. A uniform prior will make this term just constant. And the map estimator will become, become a maximum likelihood estimator. 
because we, we will only be left with the, with the likelihood term. And we've seen that maximum likelihood is, is not such a great thing to do because we, it doesn't, uh, doesn't allow us, for example, to combat noise. Okay, so let's... Uh, so today I will propose you a, a, a way of building priors on images. So again, we are looking for this distribution PF, or the, the, log, the log distribution, and arguably it is very difficult to build uh, a probability density that generates images. An image is a very complicated uh, object. So let's not do it for the entire image. Let's do it for a small patch. Okay, so uh, uh, basically, so if you agree with this line of thought, let's restrict ourselves to a small region in an, in an image. And uh, I argue that it is much easier to build something realistic for, for uh, a small portion of an image rather than building a prior for a, for a whole image. Okay, so if you if you agree with this line of thought, let's define some uh, some machinery that will allow us to deal with patches. Okay, so to me a patch will be defined on this square domain. Okay, so I fix some t, some width. Let's assume that the patch is square or d-dimensional cube. So basically, it's it's uh, it's of width t in every direction of our signal, and uh, our dimension again is d. It can be two if we deal with images. It can be three if we deal with uh, with videos or volumetric images. It can be one if we deal with time series, and so on. I will write everything in the continuous domain, of course. In, if if you want to implement it, you need to uh, to work with discrete signals, but the ideas will be exactly the same. Okay, so a patch around a patch uh, f a patch of f around the point q, so let's say this is my signal f, let's say it's an image, I have a point q here, okay, so a patch around it will be basically a portion of this function restricted to that domain, right, restricted to a rectangular window or to a square window, this square window, so you have it, as you see, it's a square, uh, basically uh, shifted, translated to the point Q. Okay, so this window is defined around the origin, so I need to shift it to the point Q and then restrict my function just to that window. Okay, so the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to translate the entire function by Q. So the Q, so the function now, uh, this point now shifts to the origin, and then I'm going to restrict it, you see this is a restriction of the function, to the square, dom to this square domain. Okay, so basically the function is undefined beyond this square domain. So I first translate, then I evaluate it on uh, on the on this canonical domain. Okay, so it's basically it is equivalent to uh, defining a patch at an arbitrary point Q. Okay, and I, to do this I will define this patch operator. I will p call it pi Q. So a patch operator k takes a signal. This is a this is a scalar valued signal. Uh, on uh, uh, on RD, a d-dimensional image, if you will, and it restricts it to a d-dimensional image on this square domain. Okay, so it's a patch. It takes an image and it produces a patch, and it produces a patch at location Q. Okay, so it is defined by this way. It sends the signal F to the patch around point Q of F. Okay. Make sense? So basically, the patch operator selects a patch at point Q from an image. And when I, I say image, it can be any d-dimensional signal. Okay? Now, let's assume, let's assume, this is the way I'm going to build my patch prior. Let's assume I have some collection of uh, clean exemplar patches. Okay, so I have K. K can be, can be a very big number. I have k examples of patches. Okay, so the the way I actually obtain this collection, I take many, many, many good, high quality images. I extract all the patches in these images. So basically, just many, many patches with overlaps, and then I do clustering to k to k clusters. So I have k representative patches from images. Okay, so let's say eight by eight patches from images. And this is my collection. And let's now, having this collection, I have a collection of exemplars. They might have, they might uh, uh, represent very complicated structures of what goes on in natural images. So natural images have a lot of structure because, because, because of the of the way objects in in the nature behave. 
the way they, they are represented in images. And I will assume the following very simple prior. So I will assume that a patch of an image F at point Q, at any point Q, is just one of these PKs, just one of these exemplars. And of course, this is a stochastic quantity. So I will assume that it is drawn, it is PK with K, the index K, drawn uniformly from 1 to K. Okay, so this index K admits a uniform prior. Okay, it's, of course, you can say that this is a very simple model. It's trivial, right? It's just just too simple. But remember that this uniform prior on the index k translates into potentially a very complicated prior on the on the patch itself, right? Because I'm selecting something with a lot of structure from that set of exemplars. So I'm 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 replacing the need to model uh, the probability density on pixels, which might be completely crazy, by the need to uh, model a distribution of the index of the exemplar, which can be as simple as uniform. Okay, so a uniform prior on k is definitely not a uniform prior on, on pi qf. Is this clear? Okay, so this is my patch prior. So let's now have, uh, have a look at a specific uh, inverse problem. I would like to, to have a look at, uh, at the problem of removing uh, white additive Gaussian noise from an image, is what is called denoising. And uh, in, in the sequel, probably in two weeks from now, I will, I will tell you why. So I will show you a framework in which if you know how to denoise an image, you can then I will show you how you can solve any inverse problem. So if you have a good denoiser, it will be a good solver for any inverse problem with some uh, additional machinery around it. Okay, so a denoiser will actually act as a prior. Okay, so we'll see. It, it's, it's called a plug-and-play uh, framework or, or a variant of the plug-and-play framework. So basically, that's why I insist on uh, learning how to uh, deal with denoising problem first. Okay, and denoising with, with additive uh, Gaussian noise, we know that imaging noise is different. We know that we can make it approximately Gaussian with uh, constant variance if we apply in SCOM transformation. But basically, you will see that even if your noise is very different from that, you can still uh, use denoising as a building block to, uh, into, uh, into the solver of any inverse problem. Okay, So bear with me, you, you, we have this simple uh, inverse problem, we have this forward model, so Y is just uh, an observation of this latent signal F contaminated by additive Gaussian noise with this variance sigma n squared. Okay, So it's Y0 mean uh, Gaussian noise. Some the, the basically the different locations in space of this noise are statistically independent. This this what white means. So what will be the our likelihood term? So the likelihood term uh, likelihood is y given f x. But now I don't care about dealing with the entire image. I I care about dealing with a patch of y given a patch of f. Okay. So I'm I'm writing my probabilities in terms of patches and not in terms of the entire image. So a patch of Y will be obviously, so I will just write it here, a patch of Y at some point X is a patch of F at the same point plus a patch of N, right? Now we, we said that this signal this is the clean signal, the latent clean signal. It can be one of the exempl exemplars, one of the PKs, right? And here we have the actually measured pixels of the, uh, of the, of the observed signal, Y. Okay, so this is the patch in the observed image, which, which is contaminated by noise. Okay, so we know that in, in all these models, if I give you Y, how is F distributed? So basically, what is f given by? It's just y minus n, right? Or basically, or n is y minus f, right? We know that f is, is pk, y is given, it's our data. So we, what we have is the distribution of the noise. Okay, so we have the distribution of the noise. And this distribution of the noise is just, if I take, uh, uh, well, if I remove the constants, it, it is proportional to the exponential of minus this is the L2 norm on our 
square domain, right? Remember, patches are signals on this square domain, or this d-dimensional cube domain, of y minus pk. This is basically, this is the realization of our noise, right? Uh, over twice the variance of the noise, okay? So this is our, this is our prior, okay? So sorry, this is our likelihood. And our prior was expressed in, in terms of the index of k. So we have a prior we have a prior on this patch of f, right? And we express it as a uniform prior on the index k, right? Because we assume that pi x of f is one of the pk's with k being distributed uniformly. Okay? So then by by the base theorem, we can write the posterior. A uniform prior on x simply means that we will we will have the uh, the the posterior proportional to the uh, so basically up to a constant equal to the to the prior right so it will be it will be this for a specific pk this is what we are substituting into the distribution and we will will have in the denominator the sum over all the pi's i going from 1 to k right so this is this is the normalization constant that we need we need to add and then this exponential of course will sum to 1 Okay, so this is our posterior distribution. Okay, so once we have the posterior, we can, for example, do an MMSC estimator. Remember, M MMSC estimator is the uh, is the uh, posterior expectation of a quadratic loss, right? A quadratic loss. This is well, quadratic loss is MSE. So let's see. Let's see point-wise MSE. Let's take our estimated signal at point x okay and our our error criterion will be the expectation of the difference between the value of the signal of the estimated signal at point x minus the value of the signal of the clean signal at point x squared under the under under expectation okay so instead of writing instead of writing my clean signal at point x, I can write the value of a patch of f at point zero, okay? If I take the patch from point x, this will be the central point of the patch, okay? And then, so th then this expectation, this expectation I can, so I, I know, I know uh, uh, that this can be one of the patches in the set of exemplar patches, right? And the, and I also know the probability of this happening, right? So the probability of this happening is given by this expression, right? This is this is the posterior, and the value of this uh, uh, the value of this signal will be pk at point zero. Okay, makes sense. So let's call this posterior distribution hk. So again, this is the this is the posterior distribution of uh, uh, so I'm dropping dependence on y. Uh, this is the posterior distribution uh, given the data y, a patch at point x from data from from the observed signal y. Uh, this is the probability of of f being uh, pk. Okay, so it depends, of course, on the index k. That's why I have k here, and it depends on the point x. I'm dropping the dependence of on y. Of course, I depend on the data y. Okay. What is important, of course, is that these terms sum to one. These are probabilities, right? And this, uh, so one of the one of the arguments, the argument k, is discrete. So I'm not thinking of this as a probability with given p k, the, the 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 patch itself. I'm thinking of it as a probability given an index of the of the exemplar patch. So it, essentially, it's a discrete, it's a discrete probability. Just have a capital K different possibilities, right? And they all sum to one. So let's try to minimize this MSC. This is how we obtain an MMSC estimator, right? So let's minimize it. I will write it this way. My my variable, I will call it A. So A is the value of F estimated at point X. Okay, so I will just write it as A. And this is how my MSC will look like. It is A, which is my estimated signal, minus the value of the 
example page k at point zero, okay, times, or of course, squared, square difference times this probability hk. Okay, so let's take the derivative with respect to a, equate this to zero. Okay, so you, you, by the way, you can already tell me what is going to happen. So w what we have is a weighted L2 norm squared, right? And the weights are these probabilities hk. So when we uh, when we want to minimize this weighted uh, weighted norm, what should a be? What should what should it look like? Should be a weighted average, right? So it, it will be exactly the weighted average. This is the weighted average. You see? So this this is what we called a. It's a weighted average of pk zeros, right? So basically the central pixel at every example page pk multiplied by this posterior probability hk. And of course, the, these probabilities sum to 1. So let's just write the full expression. I'm just substituting how uh, hkx looks like. So what we have is this sum over k of these exponential, exponential terms times pk at 0 and divided by, by the sum of these weights. So you see these weights, these are the hkx and these are, uh, sorry, without the sum, of course. These are the hk, hkx, right? And this is basically, this is hkx, okay? So I'm, I'm summing contributions from the central pixels of all patches uh, with multiplied by these exponentials. So let's have a look at, uh, at, at this exponential specifically. So let me remove this. This marking. Okay. So uh, let's let's have a look at this uh, uh, at the contribution of these exponentials. So I have the distance. So this is the distance between patches. This is the L two distance squared between between patches. So I'm looking at my at a patch around the point X of my contaminated signal of my. Uh, corru my signal corrupted with noise, and I'm measuring its distance to each of the exemplars. The ex exemplars that are close in the Euclidean distance will give uh, will give a big weight, right? Because it's the exponential of uh, the negative exponential of that Euclidean distance. If the distance is short, the exponential will be close to one. So those patches that are similar in the sense of this L2 distance to my uh, contaminated patch will contribute contribute uh, a significant weight. And the vast majority of patches will be distant, significantly more distant than sigma n, typically, right? If the noise is not overwhelmingly strong, and their contribution will be negligible. So I'm going to, to do weighted sum of my exemplar patches according to their similarity to the content of the patch that I'm, I'm, I'm about to denoise. Okay? And basically, I will substitute the value of my observation with that weighted uh, with that weighted um, weighted average, okay. Now, of course, I'm summing over. Let's say if I have I don't know uh, one million exemplar patches, doing this sum is is uh, is very is prohibitively uh, uh, expensive computationally. But what I can do, I can find a few nearest neighbors, or maybe approximate nearest neighbors. I, I will not sum over all the patches because most of them will give contributions almost zero to these uh, posterior probabilities. So I will just find a few nearest neighbors, I will compute their weights and sum over just, I don't know, a few tens of nearest neighbors. Okay, this is how it is implemented in practice. And we'll see, basically in the tutorial, you will see uh, a technique called patch match. This is a very efficient way of finding nearest neighbors because basically one of the cool thing in images is that there is some, some coherence. If I found a matching patch in one location, then if I move by one pixel to the right, probably my my uh, corresponding patch will be somewhere in that region as well in the in the in the in the target domain. So we we'll, we'll, you, you will we will see about it in the tutorial uh, more more in detail. So so basically we have this expression, this this uh, this kind of uh, weighted averaging of the of the of the patches is called non-local mean means. So I. I will simply replace my exemplar patches instead of taking them from some fixed collection outside 
basically unrelated to my image. Sometimes if I, if I don't have a collection of such patches, I will just take patches from the image itself. So Im an image itself has a lot of interesting patches in it. Right? And, and there are empirical, there is overwhelming empirical evidence that there are many self-similar patches in the image. So I might have uh, many, many examples of my approximately like my patch, sorry about that, uh, that looks approximately about my patch uh, uh, in the image itself. So instead of taking these exemplars, I can simply take uh, patches from the input itself. So I, I will write this as an integral over the entire image. I will be integrating over x prime. So x prime is some location in the image. I'm going to extract a patch at the point x prime from y, measure it, its distance to the patch at point x that I'm trying to denoise. Okay? And this is, this is the value of pi x prime y at point zero. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to to essentially do the following. So this is the patch I'm going to denoise. I would like to produce the the value of the denoised image at this point. Okay, so this is what I called f hat x. This is point x. I'm going to look around my, my, myself, at least in theory, at every possible patch in this image. So these are the central points of these patches. Let's call this point x prime, and this is the value of pi x prime y at point zero, what is indicated here by red. I will measure the distances in the L2 sense between the patches, not between the points, between the full patches, and weight the contribution of these points accordingly, summing them here. Okay? And the, re the, the, the outcome of this weighted sum will be the value of my estimated image. Okay? Yes? Okay, so th there are two settings. So two settings. One of them is uh, is using an external collection of exemplars, like what we have here. Okay, sorry, and what we have here. These PKs come from an external set of clean patches. Okay, and here I'm saying that if I don't have such a collection, I will just take the patches from the image itself. And there is a problem with it, right? Because I mean, my assumption, I, uh, I the assumption I made so far that my patches, my exemplar patches, are clean. In the image itself, I don't have access to clean patches. I have uh, access only to patches corrupted by noise, right? So, it, so this expression will not be an MSC estimator anymore. So, 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 so here I'm. So I'm writing. I'm writing this in the continuous domain. So essentially, I'm. I'm summing an infinite, a continuum of patches. Of course, in practice, this is done on, on a discrete domain signal. So I have, I, I need to average over uh, patches, maybe just at some subset of fixed locations. Okay, so basically, if in a discrete domain signal, there is no way to sum over an infinite number of patches because it has final support and final number of samples, right? But at least uh, in the continuous domain, I can write this integral, okay? And what is done in practice that patches that are far away geometrically in my RD, in my domain of the image, that are far, the, the geometrically are typically also downweighted by this, by this term. So basically we have one sigma, this sigma n, that controls how fast my, my weight will decay according to the distance between patches in, in the patch domain. So it's a patch-based distance. It's the, the L2 norm between functions on our uh, d-dimensional cube that defines the patch. And then I will have another distance controlled by another sigma, which I will call sigma s, the, some kind of a special weight that will tell me that if I'm 10, uh, that I'm, if I'm 10 pixels apart from my, my point x, so basically this is a distance between x and x prime, uh, if I'm 10 pixels apart from my x, I will give it weight close to one, but if I'm 1,000 pixels apart, then probably uh, the information from that portion of the image is less relevant, and I will give it a, a smaller weight. So, these, so unlike the first term, which we obtain uh, in a principled way by deriving an MSC, uh, an MMSC estimator, the second term is just a heuristic addition. Okay. So this is an example. 
what the image you have on the left is it's a, actually a real image with real noise that comes from a TV broadcast. Okay, so it's an analog uh, signal with all the uh, horrible artifacts that an analog signal can uh, um, can be subject to. And what you see on the right is the result of this non-local means filter. And by the way, it is called non-local means because we are doing means, we are doing weighted averages, but they are non-local. We might take contributions of the of the of portions of the image very uh, very far apart, right? So we can take theoretically a patch from a completely different por portion of the image, which 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 is why we call it non-local means. So you can see that uh, even so, in many places. There is some some texture that was preserved that was completely completely drowning by 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 in, in inside this noise on the left hand side, and what is also important, you see the image is sharp, the edges are not blurred. If you just do Gaussian blur with 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 a similar denoising effect, of course, by doing Gaussian 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 uh, uh, convolution with a Gaussian or any low pass filter, of course, will kill the noise, right? Basically, averaging uh, uh, white zero mean noise will reduce its variance. If we if we do a sum or an average on a sufficiently big uh, domain, will reduce the noise. But we will also blur the edges. The signal will not be sharp anymore because it will it is a low pass filter. But here you see that the the, the, the image is sharp because all the patches that we are averaging are, they have sharp edges because they, they, they are patches from a real image and the real images have sharp edges. So essentially we are taking self-similar patches from different portions of the image and they all have uh, sharp edges. We are summing them so you can think of them as approximately at least uh, the same latent patch contaminated by different realizations of, of the noise. When we sum, sum these patches the noise is attenuated because of the sum, and uh, we get a cleaner image. Okay, so we'll, I, I will get back to it. Essentially, again, we, I, I, as, I, as I told you, the patches that we are taking now are not clean patches. So it's a problem. It is not an, M, uh, an MMC estimator. So the downsides of this method. So the, this method. Uh, well, okay. So I will. I will say. I will say. If, if, uh, I will open a small parenthesis. So basically, non-local means is a very uh, is a very popular filter. One of the biggest downsides of non-local means is computation complexity. Okay, but to, today there are there are efficient ways of doing it. A slightly slightly more sophisticated way of doing non-local means is called BM3D. So we'll see, you'll see it in the tutorial as well. So it's basically doing slightly more complex operations on the patches, but it essentially it is also a, a kind of a weighted patch-based uh, uh, filter. And even until today, it gives state-of-the-art result in, in denoising. So BM3D is computationally expensive. There are different, much faster approximations to BM3D, but it is a, the golden standard maybe for already 10 years in denoising. So it's, it's, it's a really good algorithm. Now, I would like to show you one uh, particular case of non-local means. Actually, this particular case was derived before the general case. And this particular case will be obtained if we take our patch to be a, to be a point patch. So we don't have a d-dimensional square around the point x. We just have that single point x. Okay, So this would correspond to our square domain containing just the zero vector. Okay, So then our patch operator take it, takes f and gives us the value of f at point q instead of giving us a function restricted to q. So it's a little bit abuse, but allow me to, to make this abuse. Okay, so it's not it's not a function of a single point anymore. It's just the value of that function of a single point. So at least theoretically, this is not the same mathematical object. But hopefully, you you forgive me this this sloppiness. Okay, so then then the the Euclidean distance squared between two patches at point x and x prime in y will be just the Euclidean distance squared between these two numbers, right? The value of the image y at x and the value of the image y at x prime, OK? Let's now substitute this into the expression of our uh, uh, non-local means. So, so this is the distance between the patches. Now it's distance between pixels, between points, OK? 
And the second term remains, ag again, for some geometric, basically, attenuation of some weight that downweights very distant pitches. Okay, so I, when I say distant, I need to be careful because it's distant in the domain of the image itself, not in the terms of distances between pitches. Okay, so we get this expression. And this expression is called the bilateral filter. Actually, it was first introduced under the name of a sigma filter, and then it was popularized without credit uh, by other people under the name of bilateral filter. Okay, so this is the result of so the image on the left is a noisy image, and the image on the right is an image processed by by the bilateral filter. You can see that again because of because we are because we are uh, pardon it's smoother, it's smoother of yeah, course so so well well you can you can remove the wrinkles in this way and uh, uh, so so you see basically all these high frequency textures are indistinguishable from noise so basically they are removed as uh, removed as uh, as if they were noise but unlike uniform gaussian filtering uh, this filtering keeps the edges sharp okay so this is this is a very important distinction this is one of the one of the one of the uh, necessities to do some kind of uh, non shift invariant filtering so let me try to explain what i mean by non shift invariant so what you have on the left here is just homogeneous convolution with a gaussian kernel okay so what what i'm showing you is just one row from an image so it, it's easy for me to show you a one dimensional signal so think of f as a one dimensional signal the horizontal axis is x the vertical axis is f of x and let's say i have an edge so this is an edge this was my edge see so a discontinuity in the image this is how typically uh, natural images look like and this can be noise or texture doesn't matter so basically there you have let's say you have a step function contaminated by noise okay so you started with a signal that looks like this and then you contaminated it by noise and now it looks like this okay now when you do convolution with a gaussian the weight the weights that you are going to use in the gaussian filter so to in order to produce the value of the output uh, at this point you are going to sum the contributions of the input with this Gaussian weight and you will get some some number here okay so you are going to to do weighted sum of these orange pixels here but now at this point as well you are going to use the Gaussian weight but then it will sum pixels from here and pixels from here and you are going to get something in between this is not good right this is exactly what gives you the blurred edge and the the, the filtered image will look like this okay so this this very slow discontinuity so basically this slow discontinuity will look like blurred edge you see it? so this is just one and one dimensional cut through the blurred edge i would like to see an edge like this and instead i, I see an, an edge like this so obviously there is less noise this part is is flat right so the noise has been attenuated but i killed the image so th but that's why I don't want to, to do uh, Gaussian uh, or any kind of uh, shift invariant uh, linear low pass filtering. Now, what bilateral filter does, and non local means as well. So, here, for example, at this point, I'm going to. So, you see basically here the pixels are approximately similar. So, basically, the pixels here they fall more or less into a very narrow envelope around the value of the pixel at the, that point so more or less they will be weighted by the same weight and this gaussian is just the second the second cont contribution of the so let me show you. it's basically the gaussian is just due to this term okay which might be very wide now when i'm looking at this point at this point i'm going to sum these pixels again with a very high weight but these pixels are very distant in this axis right very distant so their weight will be practically zero so i'm not going to spill my kernel across the edge the kernel sorry the kernel will stop here right and when i'm denoising this pixel again i'm going to get the contributions of all these pixels here but I'm not going to, to touch these pixels, or at least I'm going to touch them with a negligible weight, and they are not going to blur my edge. Okay? So one 
I think one particularly useful way of seeing this is by, instead of thinking of my signal fx, think of a lifted signal. So basically I'm going to uh, think of, an, of a, a higher dimensional space in which I have, uh, in which basically the graph of f lives. So this is my, this is my, my signal. So in, in this example, it's a two-dimensional space. And basically, my signal is given by, by this graph, right? And now I will just do regular Gaussian filtering here. But now the Gaussian, just a uniform Gaussian, but a uniform Gaussian, well, even if I'm putting a uniform Gaussian here, it will never arrive to these pixels. When it arrives to these pixels, it has negligible weight, right? So basically, if you think of my image as an object in this lifted space, I will just do Gaussian convolution and then sum the columns. Okay. Of course, this is not an efficient way to implement bilateral filter, but from this representation comes actually uh, come come a few of the possible uh, uh, efficient implementations, and you will see in the tutorial how to do bilateral filtering very fast. Sure, sure. So, well, so I, I should I should be I should be dividing this by sigma s and this by sigma by sigma n, and or uh, square root of two of sigma n, and uh, and then doing Gaussian with a uni unit covariance. Both of these parameters have like weights. Well, so sure. So, 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 of course. So, so, so basically, so the question was. How do I how do I combine these axes, right? So each axis has a different contribution to the dis to the to the total distance, right? So I need to scale it appropriately in order to in order for the for this distance to make sense, right? So I I can scale the signal directly. So I will scale x by sigma s, and I will scale f x by sigma n. Okay, and then I can use just uniform Gaussian in, in this lifted space. And of course, I can do non-local means in this way as well. So basically, it will be, instead of having just f, it will be, at least in our continuous domain, it will be an infinitely dimensional space, basically, by having all the values of the points in the patch as going as coordinates in this lifted space. Okay, and then there I will do high-dimensional Gaussian filtering. Okay, so, so 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 the question was basically, uh, what about noise sensitivity? So wouldn't it be uh, uh, that if, for example, because of the noise, my input pixel is here, I'm going to do very uh, uh, very poor processing because I'm going to average wrong uh, wrong pixels. So so first of all, uh, so first of all, m the variance of the noise. I'm assuming that I know the variance of the noise, and it goes into the in, it goes into the the first term in the weight, right? So the variance of the noise divides the distance between the patches, or between the pixels, if we are talking about the bilateral filter. So if the noise is high, then I'm going to take bigger contributions from very dissimilar patches as well. So I'm going to average over more patches, more dissimilar patches, right? So th therefore, if the noise is high, that can produce such a detached pixel. So again, I'm assuming white Gaussian noise, so it has very short tails. Gaussian noise, and like I don't know anything that can look like uh, salt and pepper noise, for example, that has very long tails, heavy tails. So in the, in this case, I need really a big, a really big sigma to get to this point. Otherwise, it, such an event has a, ne a negligible probability. And if this is my case, my weight will be taking uh, pixels from here with with a big contribution. Okay, but again, there is a caveat. Once we take pixels from the noisy image itself, it's not an MMSC estimator anymore. And what I'm going to do next, we're going to fix it. Okay. So again, just just to emphasize this, this was our exemplar-based and uh, non-local means. So in exemplar-based non-local means, we had an external collection of clean patches. Okay. So our exemplar patches P are clean. We took them from high-quality clean images. Okay, and then we compare them to noisy patches from our input. So this is noisy and this is clean. Okay, and w you can work with exemplar patches, but sometimes it's simply too cumbersome, too too inconvenient to to hold this large collection of patches. And furthermore, basically, 
those co those patches come from basically some kind of a universal set of images, but your image might be very different. It might belong to a very narrow sub subset of images. For example, you have a medical image. Well, you can say that it has some resemblance to natural images, but it is different. It, it is a narrow sub, uh, sub, uh, subset. You should probably take exemplars from just medical images, right? And you don't have a collection of exemplars from medical images, so, so the next best thing you can do is take exemplars from the image itself. When you do this, this is what non-local mean does, remember that these exemplars are noisy. Okay? So what we have is not an MMSC estimator. So our MMS, uh, uh, this expression was derived, this, is, this was an MMS estimator if we assume that we had access to clean patches. But here we don't have access to clean patches. Okay, so we'll have to fix this. So let's, let's see how we can fix this. Uh, okay, let's fix this after the break. Okay, so let's, let's get back to our, uh, to our stuff. So again, I'm reminding you that the problem that we had with non-local means that uh, due to the fact that we are now taking uh, noisy patches as, as our exemplars, it's not an MMSC estimator anymore. Okay, so let's see how we fix it. So first of all, I don't want to deal with those integrals anymore. I would like to fix k locations in my image. Okay, so I would like to get back to something that looks like an exemplar-based denoising problem. So before I have capital K exemplars. Now I'm going to assume that my exemplars PKs, they come from patches at a set of points XK, let's say uniformly sampled points from my image domain. So these are my PKs, but I don't have access to them, right? Because that would be taking patches from the clean image. I, I don't have the clean image. What I do have access to is the, is the set of patches from the same location, that uh, I take from uh, from the noisy image. So these are essentially the PKs contaminated by patches of my additive white Gaussian noise. Okay, so basically these are noisy exemplars. Okay, so my prior is again on the index k. I'm assuming that the index is a uniform random variable. Okay, and my likelihood still assumes that my uh, that my patch of f is given one by one of these p's. Okay, so basically I'm I'm substituting p here, and I have p here, right? Because this is this is the value of the of the uh, of the of the patch of f that my priors give uh, my prior gives me. It can take one of these k values. Okay. So this is my likelihood. The problem is that. I, I don't I cannot estimate this quantity. I don't have p. I don't have access to p, right? But I can write so basically I can write p as uh, or I can write q. I have access to q, right? So the, the q is p, which is the quantity that I'm interested in, plus noise, right? And noise this this noise is taken as the pitch at point x k from the realization of the noise that contaminated my image. Okay, so I can write it in this way. So it, instead of y minus pk, I will write y minus qk plus uh, the patch around xk from my noise. Okay, so I have think of a clean image to which I'm adding a noise image. So this is just a white Gaussian noise image, and of which I'm taking a realization. Okay, now here I'm stuck. So let's do the following approximation. I will. This is a random quantity, right? It's random quantity because this n is stochastic. Okay. But I'm going to, and q is also stochastic, of course. But I'm going to uh, approximate this by the expectation of this norm. So the expectation of this norm is no more a stochastic quantity. Okay. And by, by the way, it's, it's not such a bad idea to, to, to approximate some uh, random quantity by its expectation. Okay? So because we have this random Gaussian noise, we are summing. So think of this norm 
expressed uh, in the discrete domain. So we have some of uh, all these contributions of the noise uh, over multiple pixels. So the bigger is the patch, the, the bigger is the number of uh, pixels we are summing, uh, this norm will concentrate about its mean. So the variance will be very small. So it's not a bad idea, especially if we are doing, if this norm has multiple uh, multiple terms in the sum, it's not a bad idea to approximate it as, uh, as the expectation. Okay, so then I will open this norm uh, into uh, three terms, right? It's just opening a square. So the first term will be the norm of y minus qk squared. And I'm not writing uh, basically this subscript, but obviously all the norms are performed on, the, on this d-dimensional uh, page domain. Then I will have so this is this is this is uh, this is just a number, right? Then I have the expectation of the second term, which is the squared norm of pi x k n, plus twice the the expectation of the inner product of y minus q k and pi x k n. Okay. Now this part is just sigma n squared t to the power d. Okay, so when when I when I say at least in the continuous domain, when I say that I have a Gaussian noise, the expectation of its norm on the domain of volume t to the power d is given by sigma n squared uh, times the volume of the domain. Okay, basically I, I cannot really define the variance of a Gaussian process in continuous uh, uh, with a continuous argument at a point. I can define it in this way. This is how the variance of white noise is defined. Okay, so basically, I, I will have this. I will I will have this sigma times the volume of the domain plus the the other two terms. Okay. So let's remind ourselves that y itself is given by p k plus pi x n. Okay, because y remember what is y? Y is pi x of y. Right, so I, I apologize for the for some abuse of notation, but basically I, I'm only dealing with patches. So why is a patch of y at point x? Because I'm interested in getting the value of the estimated signal at point x. So again, pay attention that here we have x and here we have x k. These are different locations in the image, potentially different locations in the image. Okay, and then q k is p k plus pi x k, n. Okay, so these are they, they look the same, but uh, the, the, we have different realizations of the noise. S same, same statistics because the noise is IAD, but different realizations. Okay? So I will write then y as pi x n minus pi k, pi x k n, inner product with pi x k n, okay? and the rest will remain the same. And this can be written, of course, the inner product is a linear, is a linear operator. Uh, this will be the expectation of the inner product of pi x n, pi x k n, and another expectation of the inner product of pi x k n with pi x k n. Now, this, what is written here is norm squared, right? So this is just norm squared. This is the expectation of pi x k n squared, right? So I, I have it twice with a minus sign, and here I had it once with a plus sign, okay? Okay, so I can write it like this, okay? And then, of course, I can sum the contribution, it will be just this minus sign will, will be left, okay? So basically these, these two terms contribute to this minus sign. And then I'm left with this expression. So what I have here is the expectation of the inner product of two white Gaussian noise patches at different locations in the image. Okay, what, what do you say? What shall I do with this term? So remember, th so remember the noise is IID and zero mean. Okay? And IID with zero means with zero mean, mean uh, uh, implies orthogonality, right? So these two patches, if they are, if they don't overlap, they will be orthogonal. So this term will be zero, right? So what I will say that 
I will say that it's quite unlikely that these two patches will overlap. And if they overlap, I don't care anyway, because otherwise I, I, don't, I, I don't have a better estimate for, uh, for this term, so I will just drop it. Okay? And it, it's, not, it's not an unreasonable assumption. Why? Why? Well, because I have a big image, I have small patches. I'm taking uh, just any patch in the image compared to uh, one of the exemplar patches that I took from all around, the probability that they will overlap is very small. Okay. So, so basically I just dropped this term because I'm assuming that the patches are non-overlapping. And by the way, if they overlap, if the overlap is small, they're also approximately orthogonal. So th this term is typically very small. Yes. So x is the is so I'm I'm estimating my signal at point x now and x k I fixed a set of locations, let's say uniform a uniform grid uh, from which. So x is eventually x will be any point in the image. Okay. Well, it one might it might overlap with one of the x k's, but again I'm ignoring this term because it. So first of all, uh, even if it overlaps with let's say with one or few of the XKs, it will not overlap with most of them, right? So it's, so it's, not, it's, not, a, it's not an unreasonable assumption, but it's, it's a good way to get rid of something that we cannot, we cannot treat, okay? So basically we are left with these, uh, with these two terms, okay? So the likelihood that is written like this now will become something like this. So we have QK, which is good because this is something that we can we can actually use because QK, remember QK is pi XK of the noisy image itself, right? And the the fact that we have some variance of the noise comes here. You see, there is no sigma n squared anymore because it was also in the denominator, so it it cancelled out. Okay, so this volume of the pitch uh, contributes now to basically contributes a, a constant term in this negative exponential, okay? Now the posterior will look like this, obviously. It's the same posterior. We just, we just messed up with the, with the, with the distance in the, in the negative exponential, right? With the square distance. So we had some correction term to this distance that popped up because we have noisy patches, okay? So we have the posterior. Let's do again Let's call this posterior HK. I'm overloading the same notation. So this is my HK now. Of course, this HK is sum to one. These are posterior probabilities. Okay. And let's do the MSC estimator. I would like to, uh, to, I would like to minimize the expectation of the distance between the patch of my estimated signal at point X and my latent signal at the same point X. Okay. And I would like, so uh, before I, gave you a point-wise estimate, now I give you a patch-wise estimate. So basically, before I, I only care about the zero pixel, uh, the center of the patch, now I'm giving you the, the entire patch. It do doesn't matter. I could do it this way before as well. Okay? So let's just write this expectation explicitly as before, right? This is just the sum of these, of these uh, uh, squared norms times the posterior probability of the exemplar number k, okay? And of course, if you do the minimization, you get pk times hkx, okay? Are we done? So we, we, we modified this term, right? So we modified it to take into account the fact that we don't have access to pks. We have access only to qks, okay? Looks fine. Are we done? There is one problem remaining here. So I, I, so I modify the weights because I don't have access to PK, but I'm still averaging with the PKs, right? So I don't have access to PKs, so let's, let's remember. So, let, so I cannot do this, right? What I can do instead, I can replace this by some other weighted average of the QKs. Okay, so I, I will write some other set of coefficients CK that sum to one. So I'm just for convenience, I'm, I'm dropping the dependence on X. Of course, they depend on X. For every X, it is a different set of CKs. And I will write them just as a K dimensional, K capital dimensional uh, vector C. Okay? 
and I would like I would like basically this to be equal to or basically I, I, would, I would like to substitute this form of estimator into the MSE and minimize the MSE okay so basically if I if I open up QK according to this expression so it will be the sum of the PKs average with the weights CK and the realizations of the noise, obviously, from each of the locations xk, averaged with the same weights. Okay, this is how the MSE is going to look like. Okay, I'm just substituting this expression here from here, right? So it will be the norm of these sums. So let's do some boring algebra on this. Okay, I can. Uh, again, approximate this as the sum of the expectations of this norm because I have stochastic quantities inside. I don't want to deal with them. And then I can again split this norm into two terms, actually three terms, but but the term that has the that has the uh, inner product of pi x i n and pi x j n. I'm going to, to drop it because I, I assume that my patches are not not overlapping. So I have I'm just left with the two terms. So I have this first term that measures the distance of my uh, my weighted uh, averages of the pi's with pk, and this this uh, uh, combination of the of the norm of the noise, which is obviously sigma n squared the volume of uh, the volume of my of my page domain right times ci squared and then i'm summing everything over k from 1 to k capital okay and of course the sum is weighted by my posterior probability uh, values which are already independent on the latent pk okay So this is my again. This is my estimate of the MSE, and let's just write it in a clean matrix form. So basically, what is written here? You see, this is the, just this constant value that I, I wrote before, and what is written here? The sum of the ci squared. I can write this as c transpose c. Okay. Now for the first term, let me define a matrix with a k. A, it's a k by k matrix that I call P, whose elements are the inner, the inner products of PI and PJ, the patches PI and PJ. Okay, this is called the Gram matrix, typically in algebra. Okay, and I will call it diagonal, so the diagonal of these matrices are the squared norms of the PIs, I will call it a vector P. Okay, so this is diagonal of the Gram matrix. And in this form, I can write my MSE, you see, as this quadratic function, it's quadratic in C, C is my is my variable, right? So it's it's a quadratic fu quadratic uh, uh, function in C. This is the quadratic term, right? This is the linear term, and this is just a constant. The h's are known, right? I already ca calculated them, and I want to find a set of optimal coefficients. So the set of optimal coefficients, I would like to minimize that quadratic expression that I derived for the MSE, uh, subject to this normalization constraint. Okay, I want my c's to sum to one. Okay, and this is this problem explicitly. Okay, so how do I deal? So wh whenever I see the minimization subject to something, some constraint minimization problem, there is a famous French person that pops up. Who is this French person? Lagrange, right? Lagrange. So basically, the way I solve constraint minimization is by introducing Lagrange multipliers. So I will introduce a Lagrange multiplier lambda here. Okay. And I converted my constraint problem into an unconstrained problem. So I will take the derivative of this Lagrangian that has both the objective and the constraints, equate it to zero, right? This is the gradient that, uh, that I have. Okay, it also has, of course, the gradient of the constraints. I solve for C, it's a linear system of equations. So this is what C is given by, and of course, I have the Lagrangian multiplier 
appearing here. So this is the optimal C. I now enforce the normalization constraints. I have some boring algebra, and from this I can get the expression for lambda. So basically, I have the set of uh, uh, the set of optimal coefficients. Okay. The problem with this set of optimal coefficients, so I don't really care about for uh, about the specific form of lambda. What I really care about is this inverse of this matrix, right? So just remember that that this matrix is k by k, and k k is huge. K is more or less all the patches I have in the image. Okay, k might be millions. K, k is huge, so I don't I cannot really invert this matrix. It's quite impractical. Okay, but what what is practical? Let's let's assume some simple form for this matrix, and in this simple form, I can I can have a closed form expression for for the inverse. It will be it will be simple. So I will do the following approximation, and actually it works well. So again, you can argue about about any uh, any of the assumptions that I'm going to make. So I will assume that I have some mean of my latent signal f. Basically, I can do it patch-wise, just averaging the patches and then taking the the mean of that uh, of those of those average values, or I can just take the DC of my image, okay, over the entire domain. This I will call this quantity mu f, okay, and I will assume that the inner product of my patch uh, with itself, basically the norm squared of every pi, will be given by the volume of my patch domain times mu squared. It's not such a bad assumption. Okay? And then I will assume that the inner product of the patches is given by the length of it, it, it's, uh, each patch times rho. Rho is a correlation coefficient. So basically I'm assuming that, that all, the all the patches have the same correlation. Which of course is not true, but they have, they're, they're correlated by some amount, and of course they have different correlations, but I'm just assuming that there will be some typical correlation coefficient that I will assume, so, so some, some constant rho. And I, I can estimate it from, from the image itself, from the patches themselves. Okay. So if I'm assuming this form of the matrix, this is how it is going to look like. So it will have mu squared plus sigma n squared on the diagonal and rho mu squared of diagonal. Okay, so a matrix of this form already sounds like something that I can invert in closed form. So I will write it as alpha times the identity matrix plus beta times this rank one matrix. One, one transpose is a rank one matrix so filled with ones. Okay? And the alphas and the betas are, of course, written here. So once, and I, I need to invert this matrix. So basically I have some clearly invertible matrix alpha times i plus a rank one perturbation of that matrix, right? And if I want to invert this, there is a very nice matrix identity that is called uh, sherman Morrison identity. Basically, how do you invert a matrix perturbed by a rank one or a low rank uh, update? Okay, and there you have this, the, the, this identity. So now if I substitute my specific values for alpha and beta, I'm going to get after some boring algebra, I'm going to get this. Okay, so I'm ignoring the details. You are, of course, you are welcome to to derive them uh, yourselves. It's not it's it's not difficult. Just a few lines of, of algebra. So basically, what we have here, this vector u is just a vector of ones that uh, normalized by k. So basically, u u transpose one sums to one. So basically, u are u is just a uniform vector of constants. So you see, you have. So basically, these c's, of course, the c's also sum to one. Can you see it? The c's sum to one. So what you have in the denominator is just just normalization. What you have in the numerator is some combination of the a of h, the original weights that we would use if we had access to p, and some uniform some uniform uh, uh, basically some some uniform vector over all patches. Okay, so h's are sharply picked where uh, for those patches that are similar to our patch at point x and they are close to zero when we are distant in the patch space basically in the distance between the patches and pl plus this uniform contribution so i i will define this quantity 
as SNR. So 1 minus rho mu squared, this is the power of my signal, up to this 1 minus rho, over sigma n squared. Okay, so I think of this as SNR. And this is the expression I'm going to get if I, if I, uh, if I reparameterize it in, in terms of SNR. So I have SNR times H plus U over SNR plus 1. Okay, again, the denominator is just, in, uh, just normalization. And basically, my filter now looks like this is my coefficient. It should be hk, of course. Uh, C, this is my ck times qk. Okay, so I'm averaging these noisy patches qk with these weights. Okay, and this is going to be the patch in my in my output. Now, if the SNR is much bigger than one, if I have very low noise, this uniform term will be negligible, right? And I'm going to get exactly the non-local means, which is nice because otherwise we have an, a mistake in, in some place. I must get non-local means in the limit when the noise is low, right? If the SNR is close to zero, basically I cannot trust my distance between exemplars and, and the noisy patch because the exemplars are very noisy themselves. So then I will just do uniform averaging of all the patches, of all the, of all the noisy exemplars. Okay? And of course, when I have some real SNR, something that is not infinite and not zero, uh, then I will, I will be some, somewhere in between. I will have some correction that I will be adding to the non-local means to account for the fact that I don't have uh, access to the clean patches. Okay? So this is a way to fix uh, non-local means. It is often overlooked, but this is, a, this is something that is closer to, to a real MMSC estimator than just applying, uh, applying non-local means blindly with using noisy patches. Okay? Any questions? Yes? Okay, okay, so the question was, so here, so the, so here I produced the patch in the, in the, in, in, in the estimated signal, but essentially what I'm going to, to do, I'm going to take its zero value and place it at pixel x. Okay, so this is how I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to work. Now we will see a slightly different patch-based prior in, in in next week that is based on sparsity on some other model for images, and there one of the problem will be how to aggregate patches. So I have multiple overlapping patches on, on which I estimated my signal. How do I aggregate them together? And just averaging is not is not optimal. So we'll, hopefully we'll have time to see that, that just averaging is not, is not optimal, you can do better. Like, and techniques like, for example, what is called EPLL is exactly uh, thinking in that direction, how to aggregate patches in, in a proper way. But one of the ways that we are going to see, we're going just to use a shift invariant structure that will have deep connections to convolutional neural networks, okay? So let me let me since we are talking about patches, I will well, I would like to show you some some interesting application, a very simple algorithm that is also accelerated, but by, by patch match that you will see in in uh, in the tutorial. So let's think about the following problem. I have some source image, okay. Let's say I uh, I will denote it by S on some uh, on some uh, domain omega, omega of course omega is in R D, okay in this case in R2. So I have an image of a certain size, so a certain number of pixels, if you will, and a certain aspect ratio, certain proportions. And I would like, let's say this is an image on my TV screen, okay? And I would like to retarget it to my vertical uh, cellular phone screen. Okay, so obviously it has a different, different dimensions and different proportions, right? How do I do that? So one way, obviously, is just let's say this is my this is my target domain. Okay, let's call it omega prime. How do I do this? So one of the simplest ways is just to do cropping. Okay, so I just took this portion and the rest is gone. Well, but you might lose some important information. Then another thing you can do just do stretching. This is stretching. So all the images there, but the proportions are wrong. So circles will become ellipses. 
And I would like to do what is what can be called retargeting. So I want I want to keep the original dimensions. I want to keep the original proportions, but I want also important details to appear. And of course, important is in the eyes of the beholder. But we will uh, we will try to give it some uh, some rigorous uh, formulation. Okay. So basically, you see, for example, the windows of the building that you dropped in cropping are here. So it's some kind of some kind of nonlinear warp, right? Non-uniform warp. But the tower is also big and uh, big and uh, and present, right? And it is not it is not cropped, it is not stretched. You see, and wh the, what would be the analogy of video uh, of, for a video? It would be abstracting. So suppose I have a one-hour video, and I would like and I would like to uh, show you a preview of five minutes. So I can just show you one scene a five-minute scene from the video, but then maybe you missed all the points. So the, the, the kissing scene in the, in the final part of the, of the, of the video, is me, and that was the whole point. Or maybe, or maybe uh, I would just do fast-forward, right? But fast-forward with, uh, with this ratio, you will see nothing. Right? It will be just just jumping frames. So I want some kind of a smart fast forward. So here, for example, this. So for example, here this ballerina was was rotating multiple times, but it's enough to see to see it one, once or twice, and you you got you got the idea, right? So this this is a this is a uh, half of the length of the of the original video. So again, you can think of of uh, um, of the analogy of doing retargeting for videos as well. So here, the, you, and you can retarget both the spatial domain and the temporal domain. So, again, the problem formulated uh, slightly more rigorously, we have a source image on some source domain. Let's assume that this is a grayscale image. Of course, I can do the same for color images as well. And I have a target domain omega prime. This is my input. So I, I, you give me an image and the target domain. Okay, and I would like to produce an output, uh, an image t on the target domain omega prime. It, it shouldn't be just an arbitrary image. I would like two conditions to be satisfied. So first of all, I would like this retargeted image to be complete. Complete meaning that the visual information present in the source image shall be present in the target image as well. Okay, so I shouldn't omit information. Okay, so again, this is still, it's not clear what visual information means mathematically, but at least at the conceptual level, I hope you agree that this, this is, this is uh, an important, uh, this is an important criterion, right? And then I would like to be coherent. So I should not contain, so the target should not contain visual information that was absent from S. So I should not invent new details, right? Shouldn't invent uh, uh, new information. And I can write it in a different way, but it, says, it states the same, that visual information that is present in T must also be present in S. Okay? So just pay attention that completeness and, co and coherence look exactly the same by, ju by just substituting S and T. Mm -hmm. So I try to draw these examples. Hopefully you like my art. Uh, so this is my source. Can, can you see them clearly? So this is my source. So you see, you have some some lake, some trees, some green hills, uh, a house, sunny sky, clouds, and some smoke, right? And what do we have on the right? It's a retargeted image. So I'm retargeting to a bigger, to a wider screen. So you have more trees. I will argue that having one tree or 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 five trees is is just just the same, because the the tree is pre present in the source. I have a house without a window. That's not good, right? That's incomplete. I don't have the sun and I don't have the smoke. So th this is not good. I'm coherent. I didn't invent new information, but I'm, uh, I'm incomplete. Okay? What about this? Well, so I have some Tour Eiffel pop popping up on the hill that was clearly absent in the source. I also have the moon here. Which was also absent in the source, so so uh, all the rest is fine. So it is it is complete, but it is incoherent. I invented new information. So basically, uh, there is nothing in the source that could create those uh, those pixels, right? So it's not good either. And this is an example of an image that is both coherent and complete. Okay. Sure. I don't 
Yeah, so, so, so the question is, again, so this is storytelling, right? So I'm just telling you, t telling you stories. So how the heck can we write something like that uh, in, in, in a more rigorous language, right? Because we eventually we want to solve some optimization problem, or maybe, or solve some system of equations, right? So let's try to, so essentially what really is important to our problem is this definition of completeness and coherence, right? So completeness and coherence was just completeness with T and S reversed. So completeness was uh, the claim that visual information present in S shall be present in T. Let's try to formulate it at the level of patches. So I would like to say that every patch pi x in S in the source image shall have a similar patch pi y t in the target image. Okay, so if I formulate this at the level of patches, it gives you some, some, uh, some tangible, some, some mathematically uh, uh, meaningful notion of completeness. Of course, you can, uh, we can argue about the size of the patch. Maybe you take patches at different sizes, at different levels of scale. But at least this gives you a tool to define completeness in a rigorous way. Okay, so I, that's why I'm proposing to use, to use the notion of patches. And let's define the following distance. It will be a distance between a patch to an image mimicking a point to set distance in, uh, in geometry or in topology. So basically, the distance between a patch pi x s and the entire target image t will be the minimum, or I shall write infimum, but we'll assume that omegas, basically all these images are, are supported on some compact closed domain, so I can write minimum. So y belonging to omega prime, Okay, of the distance between patch, or the patch that I'm given as the input, and a patch at point y in t. So I'm basically I will look at all patches in t, and I will find the one that that gives me the minimum distance, and I will keep that distance. Okay, so this is the distance between a patch and an image. And if the image t has no similar patches, well, that this distance will be big. Okay. Okay, so basically, for completeness, this distance shall be small for every patch in S. Okay, so every patch I take in the source, I should find a similar patch in the target. So this distance should be small for every uh, pi XS. So I will just take the integral of this distance, or distance squared, doesn't matter, and integrate over all the points in, in, in omega, in the domain of the source image. So I, I'm taking every possible patch in the source and I'm comparing it to all the patches in the target and if the image is complete, this distance will be small. Okay, so this is not a distance because it's not symmetric, it's not a metric, but it's some kind of discrepancy or divergence, okay? And I can do exactly the same, so let's just write it explicitly. Let's say I use the L2 norm squared to measure the distances between patches. So this will be just the integral over all x's the minimum over y in omega prime between pi x s and pi y t Euclidean norm squared, right? So I'm writing this, I should be writing L squared on my page, okay? And I can do the same for coherence, just let's, let me allow just to skip the details. Coherence and completeness are related one with a, with another that co co uh, coherence between t and s is completeness between s and t right i just reversed the roles of s and t and i com co i can combine them into uh, some let's say some convex combinations i will take alpha between 0 and 1 I will weight completeness by alpha, coherence by one minus alpha, and I can form what is called the bi bidirectional dissimilarity that measures both co coherence and completeness, and alpha governs how much each of these is important. And I can take alpha to be one half, basically, to sort of to symmetrize this completeness distance. Okay, so then in, in these terms, the retargeting problem can be written as the minimization problem, give me t that minimizes the bidirectional similarity between s and t over all t's on omega prime. Okay, so this is already something that I can solve. 
this is already this already looks like like a like a clearly formulated mathematical problem okay any questions so i would like to so i would like to minimize this uh, uh, this problem of course it's a messy expression with the integral i need to solve it over functions on omega prime so basically it's a variational problem because this distance is actually a function right it takes two functions and gives me a number uh, so i would really like to to solve uh, regular optimization problems and not variational problems so what i'm going to do i'm going to fix the target image i will i will be fixing all its points except one point at point y and i will call the value of the image that will be now my optimization variable i will call it tau so tau is my degree of freedom let let let's see how this point contributes to the bidirectional similarity and then we'll try to minimize it so if we we can minimize for every point uh y then basically we'll get the the optimal image okay so let's see the contribution of tau to this bidirectional similarity term okay so let's again we are taking uh we are looking at the combination of uh, coherence and completeness right in the bidirectional similarity so let's say le let's see how we how this single point y contributes to the coherence term i will uh, define x uh, x star of y prime to be the nearest neighbor uh, to be the nearest neighbor of uh, basically the location of the nearest neighbor patch the most similar patch um, to the patch y prime okay so you give me y prime a location basically a location of the patch in the target domain y prime so this is the point y that i'm uh, interested in uh, estimating its contribution i i give you a patch centered at point y prime in the target domain and you will find some most similar patch uh, in the source domain and i will call the center of this patch x x star there might be few patches that have exactly the same distance then pick just one okay and this will give you x star this is the nearest neighbor okay and i will i will define this neighborhood i will call it nt y for a point y this is the neighborhood that is defined by all y primes in omega prime basically all all patches in omega prime so this is y prime this is what i drew is y prime such that they their support includes the point y okay so basically i would like to take all the patches in my target domain in which the point y is present all those patches where the point y is absent they will be in terms of the contribution of the of the value of my target at point y they will be just constants right so they, uh, by changing tau by changing t at point y i will not affect those terms in the coherence term right so i only care about those patches that contain the point y okay so then my contribution to the coherence term will be an integral on this neighborhood nty on this domain nty that contains patches in the target domain in which the point y is present okay and the instead of writing minimum i will write this point of the nearest neighbor right so basically the minimum is realized by the nearest the nearest neighbor so this the minimal distance is the distance between py prime t uh and its distance to the nearest neighbor patch in the source domain okay and i'm integrating over y prime over this neighborhood of patches in the target domain that contain the point y okay and i can write it like this so the patch in the source domain it will be again let, let me just erase these markings so just just look at this point y y prime so i'm taking now a patch centered at y prime its distance or its uh i need to shift by this arrow to get to go to the point y i found the nearest neighbor here 
So the point Y in this patch corresponds to this point in the patch taken from the source domain. So if I write it explicitly, it will be the value of the source image at point X star Y prime plus Y prime minus Y. Y prime minus Y is exactly this delta that uh, shifts from Y prime to Y. Okay? So this is the value of the corresponding point in the nearest neighbor patch in the source domain. Okay, so basically the contribution will be the square distance between that point and the value of tau, plus some constant, right? Because the, the, the constant uh, takes, basically absorbs all the terms in the, in the integral that, uh, that do not depend on tau, okay? Basically all the, all the other pixels in these pages, okay? So let's see the contribution to the completeness term. So here I, will, I have to do the opposite. I will start with some point in the source domain, some point x in the source domain. I will find the nearest neighbor of my source patch in the target domain. And I will call the location of this, uh, of this nearest neighbor y star, y star of x. So I took a patch in the source domain, this is my patch, and I found the closest patch in the target domain, which is centered at y star, okay? And of course, I'm interested only in, in such patches in the target domain that contain the point y. Otherwise, they have no contribution that depends on, on tau. Okay, so I will define another, another set of points, n, s, y. These will be now points in omega, points x, such that their, uh, their nearest neighbor's patch in the target domain contain the point y. And this is what is written here. Okay, so the, the contribution to the completeness distance will be again this, okay? Again, here I have dependence on tau. So just bear with me a, a few more minutes. So basically this is the contribution to the entire bidirectional similarity term, right? So I have tau, which is my variable, I would like to minimize it over tau, right? I would like to find tau that minimizes the bidirectional similarity. This is my goal, right? I wrote image retargeting as a minimization problem of the bidirectional similarity. Of course, you can see that we have here some kind of averages, right? So the solution, I would just take the derivative of, uh, of the, uh, the tau. I think of bidirectional similarity as a function of this tau only. So this is going to be the derivative. I equate it to zero to find tau. This is what I'm going to get, right? So basically this is just those, just the volumes of those integrals that integrate over tau. And basically here I have the averages of the, of the, source, uh, of the source points. So the optimal tau will be given by this fraction, okay? So you see averages averages of the patches in the source domain that correspond to patches in the target domain containing the point y. And the second term, I have averages of patches in the source domain whose nearest neighbors in the target domain contain the point y. So here I start in the target domain and I, I always sum the contributions from s. But uh, here I start from the target domain and uh, take the patches that cover y. And here I start from the source domain and I'm interested in, near, near, in only those patches whose nearest neighbors in the target domain cover the point y, okay? So if you, so if you now have this contribution of a single point, I would like to write an algorithm that basically, the, the, the contribution of a single point, the optimal value of the single point will be just taking these averages of patches in the source domain, basically in, in both directions. So let me write it as an algorithm that computes the optimal values of the entire target image uh, simultaneously. So again, the input to the algorithm is a source image S and some initial estimate of the target image T. So we'll talk next uh, week about how we exactly get that initial estimate. So suppose I gave you something that is similar 
to the uh, to the target image. So I will initialize it. It will be an iterative process with iteration number indicated as uppercase K. So I start with T1. So the next iteration it will be TK plus one, right? So I initialize my next iterate of the target image to be to be uh, zero. Basically, all the pixels are zero, and I also keep something that will be holding the denominator of that fraction that I that I showed to you, an accumulator C. Okay. So then I do basically. So this is one. This is two. This this is a sequential process. So I, I do for every y in omega prime. So I'm going over all the points in omega prime. So in practice, it will be pixels. It will be a discrete set of points. So I'm going over all omega prime, and I'm looking for every patch center that point y in the target domain, in the target image. I'm looking for its nearest neighbor in the source domain. And this is my x star. Okay. From that... From that, basically, I extract that page from the source domain, and I add it at the location around my point y to my current iterate. Okay, and I'm adding it with this weight that appeared in the in the fraction as well. So I'm, I'm adding basically the contributions of the values of the uh, of of that patch with some weight. And this weight is added to the accumulator because I'm going to divide by this accumulator at the end. You see, at the end I divide by, by this accumulator because some, some pixels will be covered by more patches, some pixels will be covered by less patches. I need to account for that. Uh, so this is done for every patch in the target domain. I will also do, any, also do a loop for all the patches in the source domain. So for every x in omega, I will find the nearest neighbor in the target domain, y star. And I will add at around the point y star in my tk plus one, my current iterate of the target image. I will add to it the pixels of the nearest neighbor patch in the source domain. Oh, sorry, it's, it has to be x, so it's not the nearest neighbor. Sorry, it's, it has to be x, not x star. Okay, it's the, the basically the 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 pixels of the patch x that I that I extracted, but I'm adding it at point y star, around the point y star. And again, of course, there is some constant here. Alpha should be here. And I'm adding the corresponding constant to the accumulator. And then I divide by the accumulator. Okay. So this is how I this is how I aggregate the uh, the contribution of all the pixels and you convince yourselves that what is shown here is exactly the realization of this uh, of this fraction okay that we derived as the, the 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 as the best basically as the optimal value of the target image of course if we just initialize our t1 with random noise we get nowhere because we really rely on the ability to find nearest neighbors here so our initial image should be something that that is close enough to the real target image. So let me show it to you very briefly. It will be just one minute. How we can initialize this process. So suppose I start with my uh, initial domain omega. I will call it omega zero, and this is my I, uh, this is my target domain omega prime. I will create a sequence of domains that gradually, basically, that every consecutive domain is very similar to the previous one. But then I gradually transform omega to omega prime. Okay, so the difference, let's say, the difference between here and here in scale will be a few percent. Okay? So then what I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to initialize T1. So this lowercase index means that I'm retargeting from omega zero to omega one. And it's a, it's a simple retargeting problem because the, the domains are very uh, are very similar. So I'm going just to stretch my image to omega one. Stre the stretch will, of course, deform the pixels a little bit, but I have a, an excellent initial initialization for the iterative algorithm I showed to you. And then I'm going to to run it several iterations and get the retargeted image. Okay, it will, will converge very fast because the initialization is good. Then I'm going to do the same from omega. I'm going to go to omega two. 
and, and again I'm going to stretch omega 1 to omega 2 but then I'm going to retarget from omega 0 to omega 2 okay so basically the S is always the same source image on omega 0 that I'm that I'm using but I have a good initialization and then I get to the last omega k which is my final omega prime the, my 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 destination domain my target domain okay so again I stretch from here to here the amount of stretch is very small and then I refine okay and I get the retargeted image okay see you next week